Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to come and talk today. It's always a pleasure to talk about CMML, and um, hopefully you'll find some of what I say new and perhaps interesting. Um, so as Chris says, I'm a consultant haematologist. I'm based at the Christie in Manchester, although I do spend most of my time over the road uh, in this building over here, um, doing research exclusively on CMML. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's we sort of integrate the clinic and the research in a way to try to learn more about this disease, which, as you probably know, and we'll we'll, we'll we'll see as I talk through it, that you know there's a lot that we don't understand about this disease, and it's probably been under studied over the years. So I always start this talk, and apologies if you've attended any of my previous talks, and there'll be a, a lot of familiar slides, and you may be familiar with my corny jokes. But, um, you know, I always start with uh, just a very basic, edgy sort of background on, on, on blood and the bone marrow, just to sort of put this all in context. I can't, don't like to assume that everyone has the same amount of existing knowledge and understanding. So I'll sort of rattle through this and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to CMML uh, in a moment. So what is blood? So blood um, makes up 8% of your entire body weight, that's five liters. Every single cell in your body depends on it from before you were born for your entire life. Um, we all think of blood as a, as a liquid, but it's got cells in it there's this cellular compartment you'll probably be familiar with these these are the red blood cells the white blood cells and the platelets i'll talk a little bit about each of those um, and then the liquid of the blood is this thing called plasma that contains lots of proteins and other goodies that are important for other purposes so it's pretty complicated it's not just a liquid um, one drop of blood contains 250 million cells so there's an awful lot going on there and that's what blood looks like if you just leave it uh, or centrifuge it. But if you just leave it to separate out, you can see the red blood cells settle to the bottom. All the plasma, the liquid part is the yellow stuff at the top. And in the middle, you've got you can't see it very well, but this sort of little layer of white blood cells uh, and platelets. And so, yeah, that's blood. I'll rattle through this. Um, but. Red blood cells, I'm sure you all know, these are the cells that form most of the blood. It's why your blood looks red. Um, and it's more than 95% of the cells. And their job is to carry oxygen from the lungs to every cell, to fuel every cell of the body. Um, it's basically, each red blood cell is just made of two things. One is a protein called globin. And the other is sort of iron that clings onto the oxygen, which is called heme. So you put the two together and you've got something called hemoglobin. I'm sure you'll have heard of as one of the tests that we routinely do. And each red blood cell lasts for about four months and then needs replacing. Then you've got these platelets. They're the tiniest blood cells. Um, their job is to form a plug every time you burst a blood vessel or break the skin. Um, to start the process of clotting. Now, platelets have a lifespan of only just over a week, so very much shorter than red blood cells. And that's partly um, explains the difference in sort of shelf life uh, and also why people might need platelet transfusions more often than red blood cells, because within a week, you have to replace the ones you've already given. The ones you give as a red cell transfusion often you know, will last a lot longer. So sometimes people don't need red cell transfusions as often. And then, of course, you've got the white blood cells, which about 1% of all of them. And their job is basically to fight lots of foreign invaders, bacteria, viruses, funguses, and try to keep cancer cells in check. So, and there's lots of different types of white blood cells. And, you know, one of the ones we'll be talking a bit about today is the one called the monocyte. It's the one with the kidney bean shaped nucleus, because that's one of the things that defines CMML as opposed to MDS and other blood cancers. And, you know, put simply, one of the features of the defining features of CMML is that you have too many of these monocyte cells. 
This is the usual split in your blood. So again, you'll have heard of neutrophils, I'm sure. They're regularly tested. They're the ones we will tell you about. But we also test the number of the lymphocytes, the monocytes, the eosinophils. And this is roughly how they, uh, they line up in normal blood. So note here, monocytes are normally about 5% of the blood cells. And by far the most common are these neutrophils. This is what blood looks like down the microscope after we've put a stain on it. Um, so mostly these red blood cells, these biconcave discs in the background that don't have a nucleus. And then occasional white blood cells of different types that have different shapes. And we don't need to worry about that really in any great detail. Um, right. The bone marrow is where all of these blood cells are being made. And the reason I'd mention this is because it does help you start to understand how blood cancers can form. If you think that your bone marrow has to make 10 to the power of 13, that's one with 13 zeros after it. That's the number of new cells your bone marrow has to make every day. Okay, and in every year you make your entire body weight of new blood cells. And it's the fastest growing tissue in the human body. So why is that relevant? Well, every time you make a new blood cell or a cell divides, there's a chance of mistakes happening. When the DNA replicates itself and splits in two, there's a chance that faults can develop. And it's a very, very, very low chance every time a cell divides. But if it's happening billions and billions and billions of times a day, then eventually it, you know, problems happen. And in fact, problems occur quite a lot. Usually it leads to nothing, but occasionally it can be the wrong change in the wrong cell at the wrong time that can lead to cancer, including CMML. Um, the bone marrow is mostly made of fat. And that's why dogs are quite partial to it. And this is what it looks like um, actually inside the body, packed full of these blood cells. And some of you, I'm sure, will have unfortunately had to undergo bone marrow biopsy, where we go into the bone of the hip to try and access some of the activity that's happening inside the bone marrow. And this is what it looks like down the microscope. And just a note in case people weren't aware why we do both the liquid part of the bone marrow and the biopsy, the core part of the bone marrow. Um, it's because they look quite different under the microscope and it gives you different information. I'm not gonna go into that in any great detail, but when we do both parts of the bone marrow biopsy, it is for a good reason, okay? So the liquid part on the left, we get a much clearer image of the actual cells themselves and it's much quicker but it doesn't show you what they look like inside the body. Everything's disrupted. The one on the right is the core biopsy. And so you can't see the individual cells as well, but you can get a clearer sense of what it actually looked like inside the person. So, you know, they're complementary to each other. And sometimes one is required to give the answer, sometimes the other, which is why we generally usually do both. And the final bit of sort of background education, which again, just explains a little bit about the terminology, is to understand this really important thing about how blood is formed. So there are these things called stem cells. They sort of sit at the top of the tree and their job is to sit there in the bone marrow and make all of these other blood cells. But very early, one of the first things that, that happens is that they divide into either a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. And once that happens, Anything that comes from that cell is going to be a lymphocyte if it's a lymphoid stem cell or a myeloid stem cell will produce basically everything else. And MDS, CMML, acute myeloid leukemia, all of the things that you know, we'll be talking about today or that you've probably come across um, occur because of problems on that side of things. So with the myeloid stem cells, um, problems on the lymphoid stem cell side tend to cause lymphoblastic leukemia or lymphomas, which are different things. So let's just put CMML in context now. Um, basically, myeloid blood cancers are complicated, but also very straightforward to understand. And they can be put into three buckets, very simply. All of them are either myelodysplastic syndromes, which I'm sure this audience are familiar with, which is effectively where blood cells are not being made effectively. 
um, and we'll talk a bit more about that. But generally, that results in low blood counts. It might be one, two, or three different blood types that blood cell types that are involved. But we're generally talking about not producing enough healthy blood. Then there's this blue circle, which are the myeloproliferative neoplasms, which is a completely different group of diseases. And the problem there is overproduction of basically normal looking and normal functioning blood cells. And either of those can go on and start to make cells that shouldn't be there at all, these things called blast cells. And if that goes above 20% of the cells in your bone marrow, you've got acute leukemia. Um, so yeah, MDS, dysplasia, low blood counts, MPNs, proliferation, excess of too many blood cells being made. Um, but there are people in the middle and that's where CMML comes. And that's why we refer to it as an overlap syndrome because effectively you have features of both. So you have too many white blood cells being made that can be a lot of blood cells, or it might be quite modest, but it's still more than normal. But at the same time, you have this myelodysplasia. So you have a lot of the same features as all of the other myelodysplastic syndromes, but with a variable degree of myeloproliferation too. And that can make these really difficult diseases to treat. And CMM, there are others, I'm not going to go into them in great detail today, but um, CMML is, is, is the, the lion's share of, of, of the people who sort of fall in the middle there. And it is challenging, and we'll sort of explain why that is as we go. Now, is this going to work? Right. right, this is my very novice attempt to try to make sense of all of that. If you think of the bone marrow as a machine, stem cells in the machine, they're working to this blueprint Okay, and what comes off the conveyor belt are all the different types of blood cells that you need. And they look right, they're built properly, and they're all produced in the right amount. Now, now the myeloproliferative neoplasms, okay, you're putting the building blocks together just fine, but the machine's working a little bit too fast and too much stuff's coming off the other end. So you end up with way too many, and it can be one type, it can be the red, just the red cells, it can be just the platelets, or it can be one or several of the white blood cells. Okay, but look at what's coming off. They look ostensibly normal and, you know, they'll behave reasonably normally. They'll be functional blood cells, just too many of them. That brings us to the myelodysplastic syndromes, which is a little bit different. So here you get a different series of abnormalities that occur in the fault in the blueprint you get these faults in the blueprint and so what comes off first of all you might not make blood cells as often or as in as the right number and often they're not put together properly so what comes off is a bit more variable a lot of it doesn't pass quality control so it might get binned before it ever leaves the factory and the end the end result is not enough of one two or three type of blood cells so that's very, very simplistically, the difference between those diseases. Um, oh, yes. And when you have acute leukemia, basically everything, you're not making the cells properly. The stem cells do not develop into the different types of blood cells. You get an accumulation of these blasts, which look a bit like stem cells, and they proliferate and take over. And that's what acute leukemia is. So CMML, let's break it down. C for chronic, so as opposed to acute, which means it comes on usually over a long period of time. And it can, although not always, have quite a chronic course over many years, but it can be more aggressive than that. It is rare. It's not as rare as people think. Um, we used to quote four per million of the population, and it's probably more like 10 per million um, if you do the diagnostics properly. Um, but it's still a rare disease and it's very much a disease. And I hope I'm not going to offend anyone here today, but it is a disease of maturity, shall we say, of people as they um, become more senior. And there's actually a reason for that. And, um, you know, we won't go into the, the science behind it, but CMML is often thought of as sort of normal changes that happen to our blood as it ages. 
as our blood system ages that goes wrong and you know turns becomes becomes cancerous so it's an exaggeration if you like of sort of normal processes that happen as all of our blood systems age but in order to have the diagnosis you need to have a combination of dysplasia i'll talk again a bit about that but we've already touched on that you need to have some degree of proliferation and by definition you need to have too many of those monocytes, that type of white blood cell I mentioned. What's dysplasia? You know, the best way to describe dysplasia is just when the form or function of something is, is put together, is abnormal and is put together badly. So, you know, the blood cells are supposed to be put together in a certain way. If the machine breaks down and isn't doing it, doing it properly, you end up with blood cells that uh, you know, abnormal in their structure or function. And so you get some abnormal features of the blood cells. Here are some neutrophils. Um, you may not appreciate this, but they should have five different lobes to the nucleus. And you can see particularly the one on the right only has two. That's abnormal. We would call that would be a strong feature of dysplasia to us looking at it down the microscope. And it also doesn't function as it should either which is probably more important than how it looks. And you can, uh, you can get quite creative and find all sorts of uh, manifestations of dysplasia in neutrophils. So we've touched on this already. And the question I get asked a lot is, you know, what, what's caused my CMML? Um, and basically the answer to that is changes to the DNA. Okay, and then the next question is sort of why and i think the best answer i can give is what i said earlier that there are dna is being copied in your blood cells all the time those stem cells are constantly working and eventually errors happen and it's probably true to say that if we all lived long enough we would all probably get cmml or mds eventually this is probably something that's inevitable some people are unfortunate and it happens within you know, a, a natural human lifespan. And so you're diagnosed with CMML, but it's the sort of thing that probably would happen by random chance eventually. Um, you know, sometimes we can actually see the damage because it's so striking that the chromosomes look abnormal. And that's what we've got here. Lots of changes to the 23 pairs of chromosomes that make up our DNA that every cell has. Um, but often that's not the case and you know i'm not going to go into detail on this but basically you know what we now know about mutations and dna in cancer has largely come from work on leukemias and the first cancer that ever had its genome sequenced was in fact a myeloid leukemia one from 15 years ago now so we know a lot about the different faults that can develop and again, a complicated slide, but it's just to show you that this isn't random. You know, there are, we might talk to you about genes or sequencing that's been done on your bone marrow. And, you know, with a relatively small number of genes, there are 30,000 genes in every cell of your body. If we screen just 20 or 30 of them, we will find faults in pretty much everybody with CMML and often more than one. In fact, I'd say usually on average, people would have three or four different mutations just from this small list of genes. And they all do different things and it's complicated and people like me find it quite interesting, sort of how these sort of fit together and piece together to cause CMML. But you know, these genes have different functions in the body and when they go wrong, they cause different features that basically come together to cause CMML. How do we diagnose it? So until very recently, these were the criteria. And all I'll draw your attention to really is that you need to have a high monocyte count, which has to be more than 10% of the white blood cells. You may remember that that earlier slide showed that normally the monocytes are 5% or so. If they're more than 10% and, you know, quant and numerically elevated, high, higher than they should be, it should be less than 0.8, um, then you, that's an important uh, criterion. But you also have to have dysplasia, so low blood counts and you know bone marrow features that look abnormal down the microscope. Although now 
with all the sequencing that we do, if you've got an abnormality on the sequencing that's characteristic, that's often enough to confirm the diagnosis. And I'll probably skip through this. This is a slide I made for a different talk because they've now massively complicated the diagnostics. Two different groups published a completely new system last year. They're similar but different, and the whole community is confused about what to do really so you may pick up on this from discussions with your consultants but you know there is at the moment a bit of an impasse between these two international bodies for sort of who decides and it's all a little bit messy but I suppose the main thing to point out is that both have dropped the level of monocyte count and so actually there are now many more people with CMML than there were before because you don't need to have a very high monocyte count now to qualify as CMML as opposed to MDS. So this will come out in the wash, but I think we'll find that CMML will be a much more common diagnosis going forward. And again, you may have heard of some of these subdivisions. So one way we divide it is based on the blasts. I mentioned about these, these, these sort of leukemia cells called blasts that you know, should be there in very low numbers. If they're above 20%, either in blood or bone marrow, that's acute leukemia. Um, but there are different sort of stages between normal and 20%. And basically, the more you have, the higher the stage. And so we talk about CMML0, CMML1, or CMML2. CMML2, you know, leads right up to where AML begins. And broadly speaking, people with higher stages tend to do worse, unfortunately, because it's more aggressive. Now, we've now in the latest, sorry, in the latest iteration removed CMML zero. Um, it didn't really help. So that's gone. So we're back to just CMML one or CMML two. The other way we sometimes divide it, and again, you may hear of this, is into dysplastic or MDS-like, MDS type, or proliferative or MPN type. And that's solely based on whether your white count is above 13 or below 13. Normal is up to 11. So, um, yeah. And again, people with proliferative type tend to have a slightly more aggressive disease. What are the symptoms? These are very varied, but they can largely be due to either the dysplasia, the bone marrow failure. So the low red cells, the low white cells, the low platelets which cause anemia, so tiredness and fatigue, sometimes you know, chest pain on exertion or breathlessness, low white cells infection, low platelets bleeding and bruising. But CMML patients, unlike most MDS patients, certainly the proliferative type CMML patients will also have variable symptoms from the proliferation. So that might be that they have dreadful night sweats or weight loss or itching is another thing that some patients have. They may have a big spleen because all those white blood cells have to go somewhere. And there's a whole heap of other things that people can experience. And there are a few specifics that may or may not happen. So sometimes these CMML cells like to go into the skin or even other organs. Sometimes uh, they can damage the kidneys. So actually very commonly people with CMML will have some kidney damage associated with it. I mentioned itching and also about a third of people will have, for reasons we don't understand very well, um, the immune system will get confused and start attacking itself in various ways, what we call autoimmune complications. And it's definitely part of the condition, um, but it's not something we fully understand. And sometimes just the chemicals released by these monocytes and these other cells can sort of lead to um, fluid to build up, say, around the lungs or around the heart, and sometimes you get swelling in the legs, etc. So there's lots of variable symptoms. So I'll spend the rest of the time just talking about treatment or management, because it's not all about drugs, um, and just take you through a sort of framework of, that we would apply when we see a patient, so you can sort of understand the considerations that, that go into these treatment decisions. So broadly speaking, this very simple graph shows the sort of spectrum of treatment options right from doing nothing which 
you know, it's often what we want to do because, as we'll discuss, it's usually considered to be an incurable disease. Um, through ESA, which stands for Erythroid Stimulating Agent, which is basically a term for EPO, which is an injection that can boost the red blood cells. It doesn't do anything for the disease, but it can help the anemia. Also widely used in MDS. People who have proliferative disease might need treatment to reduce the cells or cytoreductive treatment. Then there's something called hypomethylating agents, the most famous of which is azacitidine, which some of you may have even had. And then there's bone marrow transplant. And it's sort of the more severe the disease, kind of the higher up that ladder you might end up. And we'll talk about how we split it. But basically speaking, unfortunately, we're still in a situation where we don't have a wide template of effective drugs for this disease. And for most people, we'll talk about transplant briefly, but for most people, it will either be do nothing or give chemotherapy like hydroxycarbamide to control the white cells or give a hypomethylating drug like azacitidine to generally to improve the, the blood counts and get rid of the blasts if it's progressing to acute leukemia. And the closer to the proliferative end you are, the more useful the chemotherapy drugs are. The closer to the dysplastic or the MDS end you are, the more useful azacitidine becomes. So how do we decide on treatment? So the way I approach it, every patient who comes before me, I would the first question I would ask is, you know, is this person a bone marrow transplant candidate? But the reason I do that is that it is the only thing that can cure this disease. Even with all the new drugs that are coming, I don't think any of them are going to be cures. Um, and whereas a bone marrow transplant can cure people, but the risk and the toxicity to get there is so great that it's for the majority of people not an option due to either other health conditions or age or any, lots of reasons or not having a donor. Um, but I think it is the first question because you would treat the situation slightly differently if that is someone's, if that's likely to be part of someone's treatment future. Um, and generally, if you're not a transplant candidate, the approach I would take, because nothing else is going to be a cure, is my default position would be to watch and wait and not subject you to treatment with potentially toxic and side effects of drugs. Um, unless there's a reason to treat. And those reasons broadly would be either you're, you're not well at the moment and you need something to make you better, or we can predict that this is going to progress quickly and you're better off getting ahead of things and treating now rather than waiting until it's in a more aggressive phase. And how do we do that? And you know, if we had a crystal ball, it would make treatment planning much, much easier. And I just listed here, you don't need to know the detail, but it just shows some of the many variables. These are blood results or things about your particular disease that might be different from the next person's that we know can give us a clue. And we can build a picture from each of these to try to guess what in all probability is going to happen with your disease. Is it going to stay quiet for years? In which case, yeah, let's leave things alone. Let's not make matters worse or subject you to treatment that you don't need now. Or can we have a hint now that this is going to move within weeks or months? So there's no advantage to waiting. Let's treat it while you're well enough to. So that's basically the, the, the sort of high concept of how we approach this. And how do we do it? You know, in, in reality, we use these things called prognostic tools. Now, the, <laughs> Basically, these are systems that people have developed that try to sort of make sense of all of these factors in a, you know, in a way that we can apply in the clinic. And there are so many of these for CMML. There's all, a joke I sometimes use is that there's actually more prognostic tools in CMML than there are patients. And that makes it a little bit complicated. Now, every one of you will probably have had one of these um, tools applied to your case, whether or not it's been you know, explicitly discussed with you. And there are so many of them and they use different overlapping features. And again, don't worry about the detail here, but it just shows that it is quite complicated for what it's worth. I like to use this one called the CPSS molecular, it stands for the CMML prognostic scoring system. But 
a new version that includes details about mutations in four key genes. And come to that in a second, ignore that for now. So this is the CPSS molecular. And basically we look at your genetics on your bone marrow test and you score points depending on whether you have any of these features. And then we add that to other information about your disease, the number of the blasts, what the white blood cell count is and whether you're needing transfusions or not. And it spits out a number at the end and you end up being put into one of four categories, low risk, intermediate one, intermediate two or high risk. And this is a survival curve, which rather crudely plots what happens to different people from these different groups over time. And it shows the likelihood of still being alive at certain time points. And, you know, the high risk category, we can see that the average survival or median survival is only about 18 months. Whereas we don't even know what the average survival is for the low risk group because it hadn't quite dropped as low as 50% when they published the paper. And that was like 10 years out. So this is why we do it, all right? It's the best thing we can do to predict what might happen in the future with your disease, but it's not perfect. And it's not going to be individual to you. It's just going to group you with other people whose diseases are broadly similar. This is sort of similar to what we've done before. I'm actually going to skip that. Um, this is a slide I use more to try and persuade funders to give money to research. Um, but bone marrow transplant, I think, is what we wanted to talk about now. Yes. So to try and decide how we apply this, then to decide on which treatment option, we now have these guidelines. This is the first time there's ever been a CMML treatment guideline. It's published in December 2018 by the European association and i'm when i've got five minutes i'm trying to write the uh uk version um but it's a little bit delayed so um it's it, it will come out but it won't look very different from this so i've already mentioned about risk assessment and this first question is somebody going to go for a transplant so let's just say yes and by yes we're talking generally about people under about the age of 70 now some transplanters would transplant people over 70 perhaps up to 75 it's controversial and there's no right or wrong answer but we know that over the age of 70 the risk from a transplant goes up hugely and you know once you get to a stage where the chance of somebody being killed by a transplant is more than the chance of them being killed by the disease i think we'd all probably agree that's not a great option to take and so that's the reason for using 70 to 75 as an absolute upper limit. And you also have to be pretty fit, irrespective of age as well, because complications happen. And so the guidelines would say if you've got higher risk, so if you're in one of the two worst categories, intermediate two or high risk, and you've got a donor and you're fit, you should probably go for a transplant or at least consider a transplant. It should be offered. And then there's a question mark over whether you need some chemotherapy beforehand, which you don't need to worry about for this chat today. If you're lower risk, even if you are fit for transplant, you know, we wouldn't necessarily subject you to it because we've seen that your outcome might be very, very good. And we send you to a transplant and you do badly. That would look well, that wouldn't have been the right thing to do. So there are some people with lower risk disease who might have particular features that the guidelines say you could consider a transplant. But mostly, if you're lower risk, your doctor would probably not recommend a transplant for you, even if it's an option. What is a bone marrow transplant? I'm not we really have time to go into it in great detail today. Some of you will know a bit about it. But in effect, what you're doing is completely removing the whole of your blood system and replacing it with the donors. So new stem cells that go into the bone marrow and make a fresh blood system from scratch. But there's huge risks associated with that. The risk of dying from a transplant, even in the best case, a 20 year old Olympic athlete, we'd be quoting a 15, 1.5% chance of not surviving the transplant in the long run. So it's not an easy option, even though it can cure people. 
I'll skip some of the sort of detail here. And this is really complicated, and I'm not even sure I completely understand it. But why do I put it in? This is very recent. This was published just at the end of last year. And this is the first time we've really had a big data set evidence base to go on for transplanting CMML, who should be transplanted. And it looked at more than a thousand people who'd had transplants. Um, and they applied some really complicated statistical models that I genuinely don't fully follow. But the key message that I took from it is that if you're lower risk, you are far more likely to be alive two years later by not having a transplant than having a transplant, which is kind of what we already knew. And it validates not transplanting people with lower risk CMML. Even for higher risk CMML, most people still did worse with a transplant than without. Although there was a group, and we don't know exactly who they are, that's the problem, who, if you survive for two years after a transplant, will do better. But this is why it's complicated, and this is why most of you will not have been sent for a transplant by your doctors, even though it might have sounded attractive, given that it can be a cure. So for most people, transplant isn't going to be an option. And for them, the guidelines, and I would really echo this, the next question should be, is there a suitable clinical trial? Because the standard treatments, if you need treatment, are not brilliant. And if, if there's a clinical trial, it's worth considering that. Right, sorry. For many people, the treatment will involve nothing, as we've said. If it's not causing problems, if the white count isn't too high, if you're feeling reasonably well, blood counts are okay, not needing transfusions, leave well alone. All right. If you've got CMML1, so that's low blasts, and you're anemic, if that's your main problem, we can treat you with EPO or blood transfusions. And some of you may have had that. And you know that would be... Again, it's not what we call disease modifying, but it can improve an important symptom of the disease. There's this new drug called Lispatacept. Sadly, it's not available in the UK and not likely to be anytime soon. Now, if your main problem, there's this group of people with CMML who have a very low platelet count, much lower than the other blood counts. So it's sort of disproportionate to the others. And because I mentioned, sometimes the immune system can attack the body. Quite often in CMML, it will attack the platelets. And so there are people who actually, it's not the leukemia directly causing the platelet count to be low. It can be the immune system being sort of overactive and attacking the platelets, in which case you may not need to treat the leukemia. You can just give some steroids and that can help. So the guidelines say, give that a try first. And some of you may have had that. But most people who need treatment, it will be for kind of, one of two reasons, really. One, you've got proliferative disease. So as I say, the white count is high, the spleen is big, you have lots of symptoms, sapping your energy, night sweats, pain from big spleen, lots of things like that. And so for most people in this situation, the standard of care treatment is hydroxycarbamide, a very old fashioned chemotherapy tablet or capsule. Um, now, here's some more of my uh, homemade cartoons to try to sort of explain how it works and also some of the challenges with with hydroxycarbamide so if you think of a myeloproliferative disorder as we've said the blood counts are high right it can often be all of them um, but it needn't be all of them it might just be one but basically the blood counts are high so what do you want to do you want a sledgehammer to knock them down okay slightly oversimplifying but hopefully you, you get the drift and so you want to try and push it back into that green, into the normal range, right? So we use hydroxycarbamide for a lot of myeloproliferative disorders. But imagine CMML, the problem is slightly different. So you might have a very high white count. So you kind of want, you need to reach for the same sledgehammer, but your starting point with your other blood counts is low. In fact, many people with CMML are already needing blood transfusions or platelet transfusions, even before they start treatment. So what happens here if we give that sledgehammer? Well, we might bring the white count down, but you're going to push those other ones that start low even lower because it's not a clever drug. It's not a targeted drug. 
It's effectively a gentle poison and it poisons fast growing cells. So we still use it. It's, you know, but it's a balancing act and it can be really challenging. And sometimes your doctor will have to sort of try and tweak the dose to, to find what, what might not be a perfect balance, but might be the best balance that's achievable. But, you know, it's easy to denigrate hydroxycarbamide, but it's still the only drug ever in CMML to have a proven survival advantage compared against another drug, which a lot of doctors find quite remarkable, given that, you know, we've been using it since the 60s. Um, and with all the breakthroughs in other blood cancers, this is still the only trial from 1996 that shows a, a significant better outcome for one drug over another in CMML. And it was, to be honest, more because the alternative drug, the etoposide, was very toxic. Um, so, yeah, that's and it's still the standard of care today. The other group of drugs worth mentioning are these things called hypomethylating drugs. And you'll have probably heard of azacitidine. So azacitidine isn't poison. It isn't chemotherapy as such. It doesn't work by damaging DNA or stopping fast growing cells. It, it's quite hard to describe what it does, but it basically gets into the DNA and sort of strips it of these marks that determine whether a gene is switched on or off. Um, and that's a basically a fancy way of saying we still don't really know how it works. And you know the mechanism of azacitidine is still not clear, but we know that some people with MDS and some people with CMML will respond. But I think it's really important to know where this came from, because some of you might wonder why you've not been offered azacitidine. And, you know, we have to look back to this trial from 2009. This was the, the landmark trial on which azacitidine was approved. This was mostly MDS patients, high risk MDS patients. You can see the numbers are quite high. It was, you know, more than 350 people. And the blue line for azacitidine significantly better outcomes than the red line for other options. And so on the basis of this, azacitidine got a license and is widely used. It's the only drug in MDS really that's had an uh, approval in the last 20 years. Now CMML patients were allowed in, but these were the numbers, pretty small. There were six in one arm and five in the other. Now, because the license for, C for azacitidine included a subgroup of CMML patients, uh, sorry, because the trial allowed that subgroup in, they therefore just, they just copied and pasted that into the approval. So that subgroup is allowed to receive it by NICE in the UK on the NHS, but it is a small subgroup. And basically it, the only ones on this trial that were allowed in, and so the only ones covered by NICE are people who have a low white blood count, less than 13, and have a blast count in the bone marrow above 10%. I've looked at a thousand patients in the northwest of England with CMML. That was 6% of the patients in my six out of 100. So most people are not technically eligible for azacitidine with CMML. Now, why can these be helpful? So if you remember the previous cartoon, this isn't a sledgehammer anymore, right? It does work. It's, it stops you being proliferative. It reduces the white count, sometimes below the normal range. But because of what it's doing to the stem cells, it's not just poisoning them, it's making them behave more normally. So those who respond, actually, instead of pushing everything down, it pushes everything in the direction you want it to go. I hope that makes sense. But the problem is it doesn't respond. It doesn't work in everybody. It's not a cure. We know that. The disease will come back, so we give it continually as long as it's working and as long as you're tolerating it. And it doesn't work very well in proliferative CMML. So if your white count is 20, 50, 100, technically you're not allowed it on the NHS anyway. Some doctors might ignore that and just go ahead. But the reason for that is not just penny pinching. It's because it doesn't work that well if the white count is going up quickly. And at the best of times, it works in about it's a, it's a toss of a coin, 50-50, okay? If you're in that 50%, fantastic. And about 10% of people will get what's called a complete remission. So everything goes back to normal. Um, 
but around 50% of people will improve in a meaningful way. And that's what we've just said about that. So I'll skip this in just time. So just in December of last year, this is an important trial to mention because it's the first big randomized trial of CMML anywhere in the world since that other one I showed you from the mid 90s. And this was looking at people with proliferative CMML. This is a French study. Um, and they compared it to hydroxycarbamide head to head, which is better. And the only way to know is to do a big trial where people are randomly given one or the other. And they did it and they they succeeded. And the biggest legacy of this is that even in a rare disease like this, you can do big international trials compared in this disease. And I think that's really important. But unfortunately, it reported negative results. And we were all very disappointed by that. Basically, there was no difference in outcome, whether you got this thing like azacitidine, which is called decitabine, it's very similar, or hydroxycarbamide. And there are a few caveats there. And actually, when you look at it, those who got the decitabine responded initially very well. And all this is saying is that the reason why there was no improvement is that the improvement in treating the disease, which there clearly was, was balanced out or counterbalanced by a higher risk of side effects and a higher risk of what called toxicity. So basically it was more toxic, but more effective and they canceled each other out. And so the next question then is, you know, can we leverage the fact that it's a better drug and some do something about the, the side effects and make it safer to give. And so we're nearly near at the end now. This is sort of where we are at the moment. And there's this new drug called ASTX727, which is a tablet. So azacitidine and decitabine are injections. You have to go to a hospital to get them. Azacitidine, you have to go seven consecutive days every month. This is a tablet. And it's a way of giving the same type of drug, this decitabine drug, with something else that allows you to absorb it and have it by mouth. And we know it, it, it's sort of equivalent to the intravenous form. It's had some early trials in MDS and it's now licensed in the US. Now we, I'm running a UK trial because it's not available in the UK, um, which is randomizing CMML and other overlap syndromes. Um, two to one, so for every three people who go on the trial, two will get this drug and one won't, because we want to know, is this better than hydroxycarbamide or best available therapy? Because it's slightly gentler, it's a tablet. You miss fewer doses. We know that its toxicity is less. You can also, we've also built in, we're sort of taking our foot off the gas a bit quicker and actually you know, dropping the dose with each cycle. So we're trying to make it more manageable and hope that we can see the better responses translate into better outcomes. And that's just the detail. It's, it's at technically 13 sites around the country. I think about eight of them are open now. We recruited the first patient in October and it's recruiting, um, it's breaking records in terms of recruitment, which is really fantastic. Um, we aimed ambitiously for 75 patients over two years across the 13 centers covering the whole of the UK. Um, we've been open six months. Uh, only half the sites really are open. Uh, the others will open over the coming months. We've already recruited, I think, 34. I've got three more patients lined up. Belfast just opened last week and they've got patients. So you know, at a push, this could recruit within a year what we plan to do in two years. So that tells me there's an appetite for trials amongst CMML patients, and we're already planning the next ones. And we're using this trial to sort of link in with my research group, and we're doing a special patient experience sub-study to understand the challenges of taking part in a clinical trial for CMML patients. And we're also doing some biobanking of samples for research to improve upon treatments and hoping that we can add new drugs to make it even more effective. Because there aren't many 
trials. This is this is all the trials for CMML patients in the world. You can see in the UK there are only three, um, and two of them are phase one, very experimental things where CMML is allowed in, as is every other type of cancer. So it's not really designed for CMML, um, and ammo is the only one. So you know, in the US, there's 67 <laughs> CMML trials, just for comparison. So we've got a bit of work to do. And there's a whole heap of new drugs that is maybe a talk for another day that, you know, we think are going to come along and improve upon the, um, you know, the, the pretty threadbare treatment cupboard we've currently got. And the sort of final slide is just something that I think is just about to happen, I hope. It's very topical, as in, I may have even had an email about this while we've been talking today, that this is a basket trial, which means that there's lots of different drugs, targeted drugs. And this is something I'm involved in, in my sort of international uh, working group uh, hat, but it has not been uh, open in the UK. I, I, I won't get political, so I won't explain why. Uh, I'll let you use your imagination, but let's just say it's a, it's a US EU collaborative project. Um, but I'm hoping that we're going to be opening this in the UK maybe next year. And what's really nice about this is, is it's an innovative design where basically you can start with that drug, the ASTX 727. At the moment, there's only one arm that's combining it with a new drug called itacitinib. Doesn't matter what that is for now, but it's a new drug. But the intention, and we've got a second arm in discussion that we hope will come online soon. And the plan is, if we can get the main trial open in the UK, that you know will lead arm B. And the good thing about this will be that you know if 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 one combination doesn't work, you can switch to another arm. So there's a really innovative design to this, and it's the first time there's ever been a sort of international trial like this with US, EU and UK, hopefully, all working together to, to find new treatments. And it should be, you know, something that, that is self-sustaining. And as, as new drugs come along, it just slots into a new arm on the trial. So you won't have these huge bottlenecks and these huge weights, you know, with each trial being set up independently. And I think... That's it, except to plug for my research program, which is all about CMML. Um, and I'm sorry if that went on a little longer than planned. Um, I've probably got about 15 minutes if, Chris, if if people have got questions, um, I'd happily take some. Um, I'm currently in King's College in the first week of conditioning for a oh. repeat transplant next week as I relapsed after 14 months after the first transplant and the consultants advised that the best option for me was to go again because it had worked well up until that point and they thought I had the best chance of, 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 of coming through with that. Um, I don't like your statistics of, of analysis of survival, but nevertheless, I put my faith in them. Um, yeah. But we did it on the basis that if the transplant doesn't work, I can still perhaps, if if I relapse again, I would still have an opportunity of going for the for for drug treatment for a period of yeah. time. Is Ab that yeah, absolutely right. Um, you know, I think we make decisions at population level. You know, based on over, uh, and we come up with guidelines based on evidence and based on large groupings. But these decisions ultimately for any individual have to be individualized for the for their particular circumstances you know um it's easy to look at the statistics for transplant outcomes and be a bit circumspect about them and i think that's a reason to not rush in headlong to transplant i think it's really important that we don't just say because it's the only cure everyone gets one because you'll do more harm than good that way but that's not at all to say that it isn't the right option for individuals. And in fact, you know, it's probably right to say, and, you know, I hope came across in the sort of algorithm, the flow chart of how we approach this. The first question is to think about transplant. So it's not to say that you think it's the right thing for that individual. 
but it's the, almost the default position, really. If you've got someone who has CMML and is fit and has a good chance of doing well with a transplant, that should definitely be part of the thought process. And probably your first, you need a reason not to. Um, so, you know, absolutely. I mean, I know the guys at King's extremely, extremely well. Um, and, you know, they're real experts in MDS and CMML. And I'm sure they'll have, you know, I'm sure it'll be the right decision in your case. And, you know, good luck with that. I really hope it goes well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Julie, you've got your hand up as well. Julie Carr. Hi, thanks for that. Um, as somebody newly diagnosed, that was really interesting. I just, I've got two short questions, I hope. One was the final trial that you, you were yeah. um, gave us information on. If you are on any treatment, will you be prevented from joining that trial if, if it opens in 2024? So it depends on the type of treatment. So, and I'm not sure I know the specifics. The other thing to say about that is it's a platform rather than a trial, right? So there are going to be different trials within that. It's kind of bit complicated and a bit technical and boring but it's it's a it's an infrastructure to deliver a trial um rather than necessarily one specific trial on its own so there'll be abnormal marrow one and there'll be several arms there'll be abnormal marrow two three four so they'll all probably be targeting different groups of patients and they'll have different criteria so i think that the arm that's open of abnormal marrow one would exclude anyone who'd had azacitidine it wouldn't exclude you if you'd had hydroxycarbamide okay. or EPO or some of the other treatments. But yes, there may be um, exclusions. But separate from that, there are going to be, you know, uh, what we call second line or third line trials coming along as well, probably within that abnormal marrow. So there will usually be another trial. Well, the, our, our aim is to get to a situation for the first time, really, because it's never been the case in the UK with CMML. There's not been any trials really since there was one in 2017 that was open for six months. That was the last one. Um, the aim is to have a place where there's always trials open and trials open for those who are first line, but also those who are relapsed or who've had a transplant or even have transplant trials for CMML. We've, we've had discussions about, you know, can we get better at doing transplants for CMML? There's, there's lots of questions we'd like to ask. Um, <laughs> And I think, you know, maybe the legacy, you know, I don't know whether my trial, my ammo trial is is going to be a success. Um, I don't think on its own it's going to be the answer. But maybe its biggest legacy will be to show that you can do these trials. And there's a lot of people in the UK who want to do them because of the speed of recruitment. And that, that will make it a smoother process to get future trials funded and 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 rolled out so um yeah so I, I that particular one i think if you've had azacited in you wouldn't be able to get but there will be other options okay thank you for that and if i'm allowed to just ask something else mm -hmm. um obviously the, the you spoke about this being a, an age of maturity mm -hmm. when it's diagnosed when you're not within that age group mm -hmm. might the reasons be for that just again, it's it's to do with luck. It's 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 the it's randomness. Okay, so the more if you look at the average age of someone diagnosed with CMML, it's about seventy three to seventy five. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the middle of a range, and there are people diagnosed in their fifties. There are people diagnosed at a hundred. Um, but people diagnosed in their 50s are far, far fewer. And it's, I think it is just, as far as we know anyway, it is just the sort of the, the accumulation of too many mutations in the wrong genes in the wrong cell that happen over time as a natural random event. So I don't want to get too mathematical about it, but it is really usually nothing more than that. It is just bad luck um it almost never happens below the age of 50 i mean it no. can <laughs> it can do and you know that's usually probably a different disease but that's another story so 
there isn't really a clear explanation. What we don't think, and I don't know if this was maybe behind some of the question, we don't think that it's to do with genetics that you're born with. So uh, sort of a, a predisposition that you're born with, mm -hmm. uh, at least in most cases, we don't think that. And we're not really aware of any sort of environmental lifestyle things that promote it um, in the same way as cigarette smoke promotes mutations in lung and, you know, um, some beds promote mutations in skin. You know, there isn't really anything except for previous chemotherapy. So people who've had chemotherapy or radiotherapy are still at small risk, but they're at higher risk of developing not just CMML, all myeloid cancers, MDS much more commonly, actually. Um, so that's a big risk factor. And again, it's all just because that promotes and it makes it more likely that those stem cells are going to undergo these mutations, these faults. And again, doesn't mean it will be a bad one or in the wrong cell and the wrong gene, but it makes it that bit more likely. No, the, thank um, you. On the, thanks, Julie. On the same note, um, Dan, with MDS, one of the factors was all, often thought to be benzene and um, yeah. sort of products. I mean, it, it's interesting because one of our very long term MDS members who got MDS very young and as a woman, and, you know, I have to say, when I was diagnosed at 58, I wasn't best pleased to be to be told I was in a group with sort of mm. 73 year old men. Mm. Uh, not that I've got anything against 73 year old <laughs> men, because my husband is 73 and he's probably outside the door. But um, yeah, so there was um, a link with benzene. And um, this person did say that sadly, in her youth, she did do a lot of glue sniffing type stuff. Right. And, um, you know, we sort of wonder, or she wonders if that was anything to do with her getting it so atypically and so young and so seriously. So, you know, that, that's a really good point. Benzene definitely has been linked to, as has, you know, obviously nuclear accidents is the other thing that's, yeah. you know, mobile and things like that. All these things will increase your risk. Mm. But I think the reality is it's almost impossible to prove for an individual. A lot of people will have dubious, slight exposure to slightly dodgy chemicals over time. And, you know, it's almost certainly a red herring for most people. OK, I mean, if you worked in the benzene industry and you had huge occupational exposure and you got a rare type of MDS mm -hmm. unusually early, then, of course, you're not going to ignore that possibility, that, that link. But really, for most people, it's... I think it just ends up sort of creating more questions than it answers because mm -hmm. you might find something that's suspicious in one person, but the next 20 people you see won't have those mutations. It's more likely that it's just random chance, mm -hmm. unfortunately, which is not, not a very satisfactory explanation, I know. No, I think it isn't because I think, you know, those of us who have this disease, you know, um, a lot of people say some very misguided things to you, you know, like if you've got anemia, well, you want to eat more liver or something you know and and it doesn't matter how much you explain to them that it's nothing to do with what you eat or your lifestyle it's yeah. just your fact as you sh you know you showed in your site your factory isn't mm. making things to the right you know prescript description so um it can be dangerous because if people just lazily throw iron at you and you're already having blood transfusions then yeah. we're going to make iron overload worse so you know it's and there are actually situations where it can be even worse than that. So, you know, it is, you're right. I mean, anemia is just a description. It's not a disease. Anemia is that you've got low blood count, low red count. That can be due to a hundred different reasons. Um, and yes, in these diseases, it's because of a, it's not that you don't have the building blocks to make the blood cells. It's that you can't put them together properly. Mm. And so giving more of the building blocks isn't going to help. And I think it was very interesting what you said about, you know, the sort of the um, autoimmune inflammatory mm. aspects of it, because I think, you know, sadly, once you have a disease like this, you sort of tend to let, try to lay everything at the door. It isn't always the case, but it's interesting that, um, like, you know, we've heard of people who have psoriasis, people who have terrible really problems common. with itchiness. Mm. 
you know, to drive them almost crackers, you know, and um, pitching is really difficult and yeah. caused by lots of different things. And basically different things work for different people. There isn't one thing that works with itching. So, um, yeah, it's really difficult. And you know, there's lots of people have room, rheumatism issues, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or all sorts of other things. And, you know, it can be difficult to disentangle what's the CMML, what's the inflammatory condition. Mm -hmm. But the, the links are becoming much, much clearer. Um, what you do about it is a slightly more challenging question. And often we resort to steroids. But um, yeah, the, that's a whole other area. And there's a lot of interesting science being done to try and understand that. Mm. But there's a bit of a gap between that and actually doing anything that's useful for patients. In, I can the, see um, in the chat box, I've just found the link um, for the CPSS MOL yeah. um prognostic scoring thing which is quite sort of straightforward to yeah, use think so. you can you can get it on your iphone you you obviously need to have the information about your genetics and about any mutations that you have and fortunately that's becoming more common now with um next generation sequencing most people will have an idea of everyone of, you know what mutations they have um, other scoring systems are available if your yes. consultant <laughs> uses a different one you know that that's not wrong i do apologize sorry right. um, got yeah it, it's geographical I'm, I'm five years diagnosed cmml um looked after very well by the um local royal cornwall hospital um and, and that's the thing we're, we're down in the depths of cornwall um i did notice on the map that you put on when you were showing where the trials were happening, there never seemed to be anything happening west or south of Bristol or southwest of Bristol. Um, is it possible to get on the trials even though you're not in the right area? I did think that Trillis, which is my hospital, was a centre of excellence, but um, never seemed to hear anything about anything. So I don't know if you. I don't know if you know any areas. If not, that's fine. I don't know the southwest specifically. Um, no. The reason it's at those sites is there's something called the TAP network, which is called the Trials Acceleration Program. Right. So this, is, um, this is nothing to do with CMML. It's nothing to do with, with me as such. It's a, it's a sort of network of sites that are run, well, they used to be run from by a team in Birmingham, but they funded, part funded a research nurse at each of the sites. And they basically they badge particular trials that they think are, are worthwhile and then they, they they coordinate them around the network of sites. So it does allow, you know, compared with how things work in other countries, even the USA, where everything is just done on a hospital by hospital basis almost, actually, it does allow a, an unusually good spread of, of, of geography mm. trials, but of course, not everywhere. And so the reason my trials at those sites is because I got, the tap network to yeah to yeah, run the yeah. Trial. well i wasn't so finding fault I, I would hate no no that. but it's no, it no. is interesting and so the question i think you know is about can you participate even if you're not and the answer is absolutely 100 percent yes yeah so I'm in, I'm in manchester south manchester and i've i've recruited i don't know 15 or 16 people to the trial now and mm -hmm. okay one or two of them are local in south manchester but most aren't I've got two people from near Anglesey who come all the way over. I've got people from near, well, from, from, from around the sort of, from Cumbria down into sort of into Staffordshire area. I've got mm. coming over from Doncaster. You know, if you're willing to travel, then, yeah. and we've designed the trial in a way because we know that, you know, travel isn't always going to be easy for everyone and no, no. other health problems and, you know, sometimes you might be a carer for a partner or so. It's not easy. Um, no. So we've we've designed it in a way to make it as 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 as, as minimal as possible in terms of its uh, impact. So, you know, this trial in particular, for example, there's what we can usually do all of the screening in one visit, which is unusual. Mm. Normally that would be two or three visits, but you know we can do it in one visit and. You're only expected to come to the site once a month for six months. Um, all other trips, blood tests, transfusions, anything else can be shared with a local team. Now, it's still once a month. You have to collect the mm. trial in person. So you have right. to come once a month. But it's not 
a trial like some early phase trials where you you know you're admitted for a week or you're coming every day um it it it's it's manageable for a lot of people but not everyone um right okay yeah, it's yeah. it's it's um it's a personal decision when there's distance mm. i always talk to patients in quite a bit of detail about the downsides of the trial to yeah read out whether it's actually something they really want to do or not right okay that's that's great thank you yeah, thank you and i think janet did you want to ask something oh yeah yes. just to say thank you but also just a quick question does cmml always progress no. and for those patients who have had it for 15 years or so has there been any work to look at lifestyle environmental and i know that doesn't come into it yeah. but no, it's like that it's a really great question. And so the answer to the first question is no, it doesn't always progress. Um, you know, I think left alone for long enough, it usually would. But, you know, if that's going to take decades, that can be functionally, <laughs> the answer is no. Um, and there are definitely people who don't progress. Um, some people will progress really quickly. What we normally quote is about a third of people with CMML at some point in their course will develop acute leukemia, probably 30% maybe. And we're doing some work in the lab to try and understand that process. You know, what's actually going on in the cells that turns them, you know, turns them from CMML to AML. Um, but only about a third of people will progress to acute leukemia. Others will progress in different ways. So it really depends what, how one defines progression. So, you know, your bone marrow failure might get worse. You, you know, you might need more transfusions than you did before. You know, I would consider that a type of progression. The disease has got a bit worse. You've developed a new need uh, for transfusion, say. That's not the sort of technical progression to acute leukemia that other people might mean. So I think that the words we use are important to, you know, make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, definitely not everyone progresses to acute leukemia. Sometimes people will progress to a more proliferative state. Some won't. I've seen it go in the opposite direction, right? These are evolving things. Sometimes people who are proliferative at the start can become less proliferative over time. So lots of different things can happen, including staying static and not, not very much happening for many years. And, you know, the challenge is trying to predict who's going to be in which category, because that's going to influence how you approach that person's treatment. If we knew you were going to stay steady for 15 years and not have any big problems and not progress, you're going to treat that person very differently from someone who you know is going to progress within a year. And that's what these tools, these the CPSS model, it's what they're trying to do. And they're certainly better at it than they used to be. Each new tool is a bit better than the last, um, but they're not perfect for individuals. Is that your situation, Janet? Are you in the fortunate position of having had CMML for a long time? Um, well, I've been diagnosed for four years, but they think I've had it for about seven years. Yeah. Um, and certainly my, I've just had a hip replaced and all my, all my counts have all come down, although I've still got high monocytes, but they've all dropped right down, obviously, with the inflammation going. And I just wondered, you know, you get into this... I've went from being looking at it every time I get a blood taken, oh, it's going to be this time, they're going to tell me something's wrong, to, oh, it's never going to happen. <laughs> no, I've went from that way. So um, I suppose, as they say, just go out and live your life. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I can't obviously speak to your case specifically, but there are mimics as well. that I'm not suggesting that you don't have CMML. I'm sure that you do. But sometimes you can have CMML, but then something else that's triggering inflammation that's causing the white count to be higher and making it look like a more aggressive form than it actually is. Um, well, I think, um, as you as you know, Dan, I'm one of those strange hmm. uh, cases, and I've had CMML diagnosed for at least 15 years. But looking back, I had symptoms of low white cells for about five years before that. Um, so I feel that this is something that's been lurking around, you know, for a good time. 
for yeah. a good long time. Obviously, <laughs> I like to think that that stability is due to my blameless lifestyle. Of course. And my organic vegetables and my allotment and, you know, just, you know, trying to get the best out of life, really. But, you know, lots of people say, oh, well, you know, you, you've fought it. Lots of my friends who don't understand it at all, they say, oh, well, you know, you've done really well, haven't you? You've fought it. And I can assure everybody that I'm, I'm not a fighter. I've just been living with it and doing what I feel is the best I can in terms of, you know, good lifestyle, uh, fresh air, exercise, good food. That's the best that I think any of us can do, you know. That so. reminds me of the, the other question you asked, which I didn't answer yet, was um, is there any evidence for, you know, the lifestyle over that time? So no, there isn't, um, but there's a trial being designed or may have been started in the US where one of the guys over there who's really interested in CMML. So he's hoping to look at this in a large cohort of people. So basically just taking CMML patients at diagnosis and following them for a number of years and just recording all of those things so you know are there because it's we don't know are there events you know do, i'm not going to speculate and say things that you know could be things that are of interest but you know are there specific uh things that happen to people or that people get get done to them or people do in their lifestyle that you know that, 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 that seem to predict for people who are going to have a more yeah. aggressive course or is it all just baked into the disease at the time yeah. that it comes on i mean it's so it's you know, so interesting but um call me a cynical old woman and i am um i do wonder with cmml because of the the numbers involved which are very few you know if you're a drugs company well, you're not going to be you, you know you're not going to be making much money so we do drug. we do run into that issue so one area that we're trying to work on is repurposing drugs so i think you're going to it's a bit of a struggle to get drug companies to start a whole new r d program just to develop a cmml drug i mean you know that said we've got funding from the medical research council to try and develop something that's really exciting and early phase not worth discussing here in, in detail but you know there are people willing to fund this but in the commercial sector where we have had some penetration is sort of drugs that have already been developed for other diseases where there's a rationale for trying it in cmml they're often open to that it can still be a bit of a challenge to persuade them to commit company funds um but you know in that sense i often say that the new diagnostic guidelines in dropping the threshold to 0.5 that might work actually because yeah, we're going yeah to it, it works in our it being a more common it, disease yeah it brings more people in doesn't it and I, I was a little bit annoyed about that because my monocyte count has hovered between just under one and just over one so sometimes yeah. i didn't have cmml presumably because i didn't meet the well, over that's... one but now they've moved it down to 0.5 you're Annoyingly, always... I definitely have it. And the other annoying thing was that I was in C CMML zero and I've been upgraded. So, you know. Right. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm hoping to do and watch this space really with our research is, you know, I've, I've got data for nearly a thousand people now. So it's, you know, it is rare, but we're starting to get big numbers. And, you know, what you raise is a bit of a bugbear of mine is the sort of uh, the nonsense of, being really strict with definitions and cutoffs because mm. I've got patients like you who, you know, one week I see them and they've got CMML and the next week they've got MDS and then the next week they're back to CMML again. Now, obviously it's the same disease yeah, and that's a bit of a nonsense and it's confusing for patients as well. Um, so I think, and this is very much not to be minuted because <laughs> this is this is possibly controversial and provocative in in the community, but I think that we will be changing how we think of it and we'll be doing it based on the mutations. So I can see there are different patterns of mutations, different which cause slightly different diseases. So your CMML will be different from someone else's. And I think there might be a better way of defining and describing and labeling these diseases. Do you have a handle, Dan? It's just something that struck me of, um, you know, how many people do you think because uh, I don't think the um, the NHS data on this is particularly 
uh, coherent, but ha do you have a feeling for how many people in the UK at any one time mm. are suffering with CMML or how many new cases per year or? New cases per year, yes. Um, yeah. So that's the incidence and we know, so the best people for this, there's this group in York, the Hematological Malignancy Research Network, I think it is. And that it's, it's all publicly available data, HMRN. Um, they've got a really good website and you can play with the statistics and it's based on large population studies in the UK and they update it every so often. I use, in fact, Blink and you'll, you'll have missed it, but I used a, an image from, from their website in the talk. Um, so that's an interesting place to look for the epidemiology and they do give incident statistics. I think it's at that point, it was about, I think you'd probably be looking at about 700 people newly diagnosed in the UK per year, six to 700. I think it's probably more than that. Um, but it's that sort of order. Now the prevalence, which is how many are actually living with CMML is a slightly more difficult thing to measure. And I don't know the answer to that. Mm. It's the same with MGS. You know, we know the incidents, but we don't necessarily know the. the People are recorded at time. diagnosis. Yeah. There are yeah. ways of recording that and ca cal calculating, counting people as they're diagnosed, but it's kind of harder to know who at any one moment snapshot in time is living with it. Mm. 